Okay, um, thank you for coming, everyone. And, um, I'm really glad and um, grateful to have a chance to speak at this meetup. So, Kaggle is um, nowadays de facto standard data mining platform, and uh, it started in 2010. I'll go over some of the uh, statistics about Kaggle competitions in a later slide. And other than uh, KDD Cups, Kaggle, Netflix, uh, there are other um, data science competitions platforms such as uh, Cloud Analytics or Driven Data. So, um, talking about Kaggle competitions, Kaggle is uh, now the biggest data mining competition platform with, uh, uh, and it has hosted more than 200 competitions since 2010, and it has about 400,000 competitors registered it, uh, at Kaggle. And uh, it has awarded more than $3 million prize uh, so far. Um, so who won um, all this prize money? <laughs> so uh, these are all the um, uh, Kaggle competitions hosted since 2010, and as you can see, um, y-axis shows number of teams participated in each data mining competition hosted at Kaggle, um, and um, x-axis shows the competition deadline for each uh, competition. And the size of bubble indicate the uh, total prize money awarded um, across the winners. And there are um, in-class competitions um, marked in red, and um, regular competitions are marked in blue. As you can see, um, the number of uh, participants uh, keep increasing, so which means uh, competition uh, gets more and more uh, competitive. And if you look at uh, the prize money, uh, this is um, Heritage House Prize uh, ended in 2013 and awarded $500,000 uh, to the winners. And there are a lot of, um, um, also many um, uh, competitions awarded more than $100,000. And usually the um, prize money uh, raises somewhere between like a couple of thousands to a couple of um, 10,000. <coughs> So again, who's getting this money? You know, we are all doing data science, but um, who's the ones? Who are the ones uh, who are getting uh, this money? So here are people, um, here are top uh, Kegelers as of um, October 2015. And uh, you might think uh, that uh, top Kegelers uh, must have like PhDs in machine learning in computer science specialized in like deep learning or like highly uh, scalable like big data engineering. Um, but if you review a uh, profile of uh, each of top Kegelers, uh, you'll be surprised uh, not seeing that kind of like highly skilled PhDs from um, like Ivy League schools. For example, Gilbert, um, the new champ, so he became the number one at Kaggle just last week. So he's a new champ uh, at 400,000 Kaggle community. Uh, he's from Brazil. He holds a uh, master's degree in um, telecommunications, and he, he is an uh, uh, electronics engineer. He has been uh, an electronics engineer for his entire career. So no PhD, no computer science background. In uh, second place is Owen John. He has been long time champ um, at Kaggle, and he won uh, many uh, competitions. Uh, but he didn't have a PhD either. So uh, he got his master's degree, um, and he used to work at AIG, but uh, he used to be an electrical engineer, engineer instead of like data scientist or uh, machine learning researcher. And um, Mario from Greece, 
actually he's pursuing his PhD now, so it's kind of exceptional. Uh, and uh, Spath also doesn't have PhD. So most of them are um, either like mathematics background or STEM background or engineering background. Um, but uh, out of top 10, only uh, Dmitry got his PhD, but not in computer science, but in mathematics. So nobody in top 10 actually got a PhD in computer science. So PhD or computer science degree is now required to win this competition, which is good news uh, for most of us. I myself uh, um, had an electrical engineering background for my bachelor and um, um, master's degree. I uh, eventually earned my PhD in computer science, but specialized in not in machine learning, but in um, neuroscience. So I also uh, didn't have uh, uh, didn't have background in like like machine learning or deep learning or any of those. So it's not required. It turned out uh, it's not mandatory. So um, good <coughs> engineering background. Good math background, good statistical background can get you a uh, top uh, spot at this uh, data mining competition. So there are a lot of hope. Um, and Kegelers in town. So, <laughs> yeah, thank you. So I'm currently uh, ranked at 15th. Um, so now it's uh, slightly below 400,000. I, um, my highest rank was a uh, top 10, and um, I won uh, four competitions at Kaggle, and two competitions at KDB Cups, and another competition at uh, Driven Data. And <coughs> I'm local in LA ever since I came to the state in 10 years ago. I worked at Opera Solutions in San Diego after um, my PhD, and then worked at Demand Media, uh, where I um, worked with Ainsun and Sansu, which is another Kaggle Masters in town. <coughs> so we have another Kaggle Masters in town, too. So Han Lee, so here at Kulu, is also Kaggle Masters. Uh, with Han and Bang, uh, who is an ex-Kulu member, um, we won the Arbitral competitions together. And with Sansu Lee uh, from Retention Science, um, we didn't win the uh, competition, but um, we finished seventh uh, at the uh, trade exchange competition. And I believe that uh, there may uh, are, uh, there may be a lot more uh, cagglers, but simply we didn't have a chance to get together and know uh, each other yet. So I hope this meetup uh, will be a chance to actually um, communicate and get connected um, um, among LA data scientists and LA cagglers together. So for those who are not familiar with uh, uh, competitions, uh, let me briefly um, introduce you about uh, of the structure of, of data mining competitions. So at the beginning, you will be given the training data set for the features and then uh, its labels. Uh, also, you will be given the test data uh, for the features, but without a label. And then you start to build uh, your um, uh, algorithm, your uh, predictive model, uh, given training data, and um, your job is to make a predictions on the labels for test data. And then uh, you make a submissions uh, throughout the competitions. And you will be given your score uh, on your submission set. But it's not on the 100% of test, uh, test data, but will be uh, uh, against partial test data. So let's say uh, here the error metric was root mean square error and uh, as soon as you submit your predictions for test data, you will be given uh, the scores, how uh, well your submission 
predicts the labels of test data, also the rank, uh, current rank, uh, in terms of uh, public leaderboard. Um, so uh, you'll be given the score and rank uh, throughout the competition. But this is not the um, end of the story. Even if you finish uh, the top at, on the public leaderboard, uh, this is not the final rank. When competition ends, your submission will be scored against uh, the other part of the remaining uh, portion of test data, so which was not used during um, the public leaderboard scoring. So, oh, sorry. And this, oh, again, sorry. <laughs> and this score can uh, be um, different from your score on public leaderboard because it is measured against a different data set. What happens uh, open times is you fish very well on your public leaderboard, but it turned out that you didn't do really well on the private leaderboard, and you missed the uh, prize. So this is one of the like um, recent competition. We, um, uh, my team finishes the first on the public leaderboard out of uh, over 2,000 teams, but we missed the prize. Uh, the prize was given to top three, and but uh, we missed the uh, like by two places. So your job is uh, with this limited information, you keep trying to uh, build a model um, that can optimize scores on your private leaderboard that you never have a chance to uh, observe. So this is. Uh, common uh, competition structure across all the data mining, com data science competitions, uh, KDD Cups, Kaggle, or uh, any other competitions. Um, do you have any questions? Is it always the same subset that you get um, validated on during the public, for the public leaderboard? Yes. So uh, public, leader, uh, public set and private sets are um, identical throughout the uh, competition. So do all the uh, problems have uh, solutions to them, or do you have cases where you don't know what the solution might be, you know, like in a supervisor? There are, um, mm -hmm. that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a few competitions for unsupervised learning um, for which um, the uh, solution is not given. But most of competitions are um, for supervised learning. It can be like whether this user will uh, be converted or not. This user will purchase this plan or not, and you will get uh, like uh, millions of, of, of different users, and some of them are hold out as a uh, private uh, test data set. Then you need to train, build a model uh, with a data set uh, you are given uh, for all the labels, uh, and then you need to predict. The, uh, against the test data set for which uh, you are not given the label. Okay. I guess it varies a lot, but how much time usually given to, from the time the data release to the time of deadline? Mm -hmm. Yeah, usually it's two to three months, but um, the extreme cases are there is there are um, hackathons, oh. which is just a one day competition. So you start. Uh, like 12 a.m. today, and then um, it ends 12 a.m. tomorrow. Also, there um, there were like Netflix competitions. Netflix grand prize competition lasted four years. Started in 2006 and ended in 2009. Um, so these are exceptional cases, but usually it range, ranges uh, somewhere between two months to three months. So if you have good two months to uh, <laughs> debug, then this will be a very good uh, opportunity. So uh, is the problem always like a case that you have a feature you have to use, or sometimes they just give a raw uh, signal from where we can extract features? Yeah, good question. Both cases are um, um, true. 
So there are some competitions that uh, they just dump to database and uh, hand out to you. So that will be like uh, 10 different um, um, data tables from um, SQL Server. Then you need to figure out how, how to link uh, each table. And uh, there are competitions um, with the uh, anonymized features. So you have no information at all about um, which feature represents what. Um, just that it's all numbers or all uh, characters. Then um, there is nothing to do, with, uh, nothing you can do about it. Just uh, you need to do some transformation and just build a model with it. So both uh, type of uh, competitions are available. Yeah? Uh, if we overlook the dragging rights, Mm -hmm. Do you ever did do uh, an investment analysis to see if this is a good <laughs> to compete with yeah. the risks and rewards that are involved? Um, mm -hmm. That's a very difficult question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you are a data scientist. Yeah, I spent, um, frankly, I spent a lot of time on this competition. Um, and, but if someone asked me about how much return you got, then um, well, at least I can say I spent this time because it was fun. So this is my hobby. So uh, some people have a hobby of like um, video recording. <laughs> some people have a hobby of like um, go fishing. And this is my hobby. So whenever I, I have some extra time, like um, either 30 minutes or an hour, yeah, I will work on it. <laughs> it's also some learning experience. Yeah. Yeah. So I think one of the biggest challenges with Kaggle is data leakage. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you competed in any competition that had data leakage and if you can say a few words about what happened and uh, how they deal with it. Obviously it's not only Kaggle but mainly the competition admins who mm -hmm. have to do something and I think anything they do is kind of not good, so there are not good options, but I wonder if you have any close experience with data mm -hmm. leakage. Yeah, um, there are many different cases about data, data leakage. So when some people got perfect score on the leaderboard, then um, we can start suspecting that, oh, there might be some leakage. Mm -hmm. And if admin fi find it out, then either they really re-release a new data set uh, and just uh, remove all the entries submitted at, uh, by that point. But many cases, leakage is not that obvious. So it's not obvious to admins. Also, it's not obvious to competitors. So some competitors might find uh, some features are leakage and are useful to make a predictions, but um, most most of the competitors might not just notice it. And it might not be just a direct, uh, uh, it might not give you like perfect score. Uh, it will help you predict better, but um, it might not give you perfect score. Then um, competition will just go on. And at the end of the day, when winners disclose their solutions, people will know that, oh, that's not real. That's, that's not available in the real. Uh, life, but we just uh, live with that yeah, at that point. Actually, uh, I'll show um, one of the examples of uh, such a leakage, which is very indirect uh, leakage, but uh, it was one of the key components to win the competition. Yeah. Can you explain what data leakage is? Uh, data leakages. So the whole point of having uh, removing <coughs> Uh, labels from test data is that you want to uh, make a predictions on the data set you don't know about the target. But data leakages, uh, the link between features to the target. So if you have these features, it will give you partial information about the uh, labels. So if search data leakage is available in the test data, uh, as a feature, then you can actually infer the labels based on this um, this input features, which is given to uh, competitors at the beginning. So, getting perfect score with that feature.
does it mean that you have capability to make that kind of good predictions in real life? In real life, uh, that kind of mitigation doesn't exist. Any other questions? Are you allowed to use like publicly available data in your solutions? Like, if you find publicly available features out there? Oh, um, that's also a case by case. So there are some competitions allowing uh, external data, um, but also there are competitions uh, pre uh, prohibiting uh, using external data. And if it's allowed, uh, using extra external data is really key to the uh, window. Any other questions? Okay. So this is secret source of this. Best practice. Um, if I um, if I'm fortunate enough to motivate you to try um, any data mining competitions. Um, I'd like to give you some tips uh, to begin with. If you follow these best practices, the chances are you will get pretty uh, good scores uh, from the beginning. Um, if you don't follow these best practices, the chances are no matter um, like who you are, like uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, even if you are like a, a professor at MIT with a machine learning background you won't be able to make a, um, a, a prediction at, um, at least within um, data mining competitions. So first, feature engineering. And second, machine learning algorithms. But I don't want to, uh, I don't, I don't want to scare you uh, if you don't have um, like deep machine learning background or algorithmic background because there are F for everything. There are tools for everything. So if you don't have any um, uh, machine, deep machine learning background, you can still make use of machine learning algorithm. And cross validation. So how you validate uh, your um, model and ensemble. So this is kind of the most popular uh, practice nowadays among winners at um, competitions. So what do I mean by feature engineering. When you get the um, initial data set, uh, it might not uh, be uh, usable or feasible to build a model. So uh, for example, if it has a lot of mis missing values or if it has a lot of outliers, um, how, how are you going to handle it? And um, there are algorithms like neural network or logistic regression um, that can perform um, well only if um, input uh, features are input features are distribu distributed in a certain way. So um, to address that, when you have a numerical uh, variables or numerical features, common practice is if your numerical features are all positive, which is the case when you deal with um, count variables like um, number of users, number of page views, or, um, or revenues. Uh, revenues can go nearly, but uh, um, hopefully not nearly. Then um, the, usually it will follow exponential uh, distribution. Then uh, common practice is you take a low transformation of it, or if it can be zero, then low of zero uh, is not uh, defined, so instead of of basic low, you take a one plus um, low. Also, normalization. It can mean simple scaling. It can make, <coughs> which means you make the standard deviation of one and um, the mean of zero. But it can also mean that you force the probab probabilistic distribution of certain feature to be Gaussian or to be normal. So you can do that by using empirical cumulative uh, distribu uh, distribution function. Also, you can uh, make it categorical variable by using binarization, so which means for each uh, uh, unique value of uh, numerical features or 
of put certain range range of um, values, you assign dummy variable. So uh, when you deal with um, age variables, you can have one binary, one dummy variable for the age between zero to four, and another binary dummy variable between the age of uh, five to ten, or etc. So you can turn a numerical variables into uh, categorical variables. And when you have categorical variables, um, let's say gender, so um, either male, female, Facebook has uh, 11, 11 different uh, definitions of, of genders. Then um, uh, before you uh, put it into the model, you need to turn into um, some numerical representation. So the common practice is using one of encoding, which means for uh, each of unique uh, value, you create, a, again, dummy variable. So uh, for all the values of male, you will have a male dummy variable uh, being zero uh, if it's female, or one if it's male, or another. And add a female variable, which being a one if it's female, um, and zero if it's not female. So in it becomes problematic if you have really high cardinality in your categorical variable. Let's say cookie. So in click-through rate predictions uh, in ad tech companies, click -through, um, you need to predict based on cookie ID and all this uh, information, you need to predict whether this cookie ID will convert or not. And if you want to uh, transform um, cookie ID using one of the encoding, um, um, the, you, you can end up having like uh, more than 100 million uh, dummy variables. In the case, what you can do is you can group infrequent um, unique values into uh, one dummy variable um, and don't create uh, a dummy variable for every single unique values. So let's say you group uh, any unique values appearing less than 10 times into one bucket, one dummy variable, and you create dummy variable for any other unique value appearing more than 10 times um, on one, dummy, um, one dummy variable. Then you, you can reduce the cardinality a lot uh, by having this uh, common <coughs> infrequent, uh, common dummy variable for infrequent unique values. Another most popular uh, transformation is TF idea which is more uh, for uh, text uh, processing or natural language processing. So when you process uh, human language, natural languages, like um, Amazon review or Yelp reviews, you want to turn uh, those uh, reviews, like sentences, into numerical uh, variables. Then you can do one of the encode, but uh, it will uh, end up with um, high cardinality again. So instead of, instead of doing that, you can actually measure um, how, uh, the frequency of each term, like how many times uh, boy appears, how many times um, four appears in, in real sentence. And then you can discount it by uh, the, some, uh, some number called the document frequency. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on each transformation because it's the information you can easily get uh, from like Wikipedia or any um, slide out there. Um, just I, uh, I'd like to give you keywords uh, you can work on. So another popular uh, transformation for categorical variable is weight of evidence, um, which uh, is you measure the response rate uh, for each unique value. So let's say uh, we are predicting uh, conversion uh, click-through rate uh, for uh, different genders. Um, so gender is a categorical variable we are not transform. And click-through rate is uh, our target uh, variable. Um, so if this user clicks, then uh, our target variable will be one. If this user doesn't click, target variable will be zero. Um, by response rate, what I mean is you uh, calculate average uh, click-through rate for each unique value in the categorical variable. So uh, let's say for all the male uh, 
values, the average, um, average click-through rate was 50%. Then you replace the male, uh, male with 0 0.5. So you replace unique value in the categorical variable with the response, uh, response um, target response rate, uh, which is a numeric number. And let's say for female click-through rate, average click-through rate was 20%. Then you replace all the female values with 0 0.2. And then uh, rate of evidence um, actually goes one step further uh, by make the numerical variable suitable, suitable for logistic regression or um, uh, neural networks. But um, you can um, approve for that. Also, common uh, features are time series uh, features. Uh, I'm curious, what percent of, of these competitions do you think have to do with working with text versus numerical stuff? Um, if you are asking about working with tech, uh, working with <coughs> categorical variables versus working with numerical variables, I would say 99% of time you need to work with both type of uh, variables. But if you are asking about uh, text features specifically, um, that would be yeah a lot less. So usually uh, in every tag, um, when you need to predict um, like response rate for like some ad or some reviews, then uh, you need to process natural language. Then uh, you need to uh, do TFID ad or other uh, text related uh, transformation. But most of cases. Um, uh, it won't be the case. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? So this slide is um, um, uh, intentionally very dense because we are covering a lot of things. But um, I, I want you to use this slide as a like starting point. So uh, when you want to start, uh, just uh, uh, try to. Uh, do some research and uh, try to use one transformation at a time, then it will be uh, you will find it very helpful. And for time series uh, features, the common practice is so um, you you will see this time series data for um, a lot of medical uh, data uh, data competitions. Like um, you need to deal with um, like EEG signals or um, or what else? Um, I cannot think of other examples. But in that case, uh, the most common practice is uh, you take some basic test against the time series of data. So you get the maximum, minimum, mean, and standard deviation, and use those statistics as your input variables instead of whole time series. Another a popular transformation is um, FFT. So you transform this time series data into frequency <coughs> domain and get the statistics from frequency domain. Um, also, for uh, audio signal, uh, MFCC is a popular uh, transformation. And for neural signal, ERP is a popular transformation. So these are all the uh, all from winning solutions from um, <laughs> Um, time series related data mining competitions. And there is another trick. Um, you can actually turn numerical variables or time series variables into categorical variables by using machine learning algorithms. So this is kind of like advanced um, transformation. And uh, I put the references here so, um, so that if you are interested in uh, you can go deeper. Uh, the basic idea is you train either random forest or gradient boosting machine against your numerical features or time series features. Then at the end of the day, what you get is you get a bunch of trees with a bunch of nodes. And for each unique uh, numerical value or time series value, it will be assigned into a certain node in the random forest or gradient boosting machine. Then you take the uh, number of ID of node as your categorical variables. So let's say 
some numerical variable fell into after training a thousand random forests of trees, uh, you found that certain value fell in like 39th node in the random forest um, <coughs> in uh, this tree. Then 39 and P5, these, these become um, categorical variable uh, replacing the original numerical variables or time series variables. So, any questions about it? Uh, what language do you usually work in? Um, mainly Python. Um, you know, uh, in addition to some hint of R, also some hint of C++. I was, I was talking to a friend who just got a job at eBay, and I'm learning R. My master, and he was like, no, 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 we don't use R, we use Python. Um, his issue is with memory. Mm -hmm. Do you find that you run into that a lot with R in terms of loading data sets? Or? Yes, a lot. <laughs> That's why uh, I initially started with, uh, uh, with R first, uh, back in 2011 and 12, but I, tra I transitioned into Python because of memory issues. But uh, there are some um, good uh, remedies for all memory issues now. So, for example, there, there are like cloud basis uh, solutions uh, such as H2O or uh, Domino Data Lab, uh, which you can um, build your R models on the cloud and either increase the capacity, memory capacity, um, uh, as you go. So if you if you need more memory, it will increase uh, the memory for you. Um, but talk uh, to me after the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> it comes with some um, price tag. <laughs> Any other questions? Can you give an intuition why uh, using categorical data better helps the prediction? Because when you transform the numerical categorical, mm -hmm. you already lose some information, right? Right. Um, that's mainly because of, so the reason why we are applying these transformations are, um, this tra um, the reason why we are applying this transformation is that for uh, some algorithms, um, it works only. Uh, it works well only if the distribution of uh, input numerical variables follow certain distribution, mostly normal distribution or Gaussian right, distribution. But if you transform it to uh, categorical, it's, it's not normal anymore. It's not normal anymore, but it makes the case a lot simpler. So now the algorithm needs to determine. Um, deal with only one zero signal instead of whole distribution. So it works really well with neural networks, logistic regression, factorization machine, metric factorization. If you have numerical variables and you uh, didn't capture outliers well enough, then the chance is that um, it will screw up the performance of neural networks entirely. So to avoid the such a case, such uh, like extreme case, um, and make it more reproducible. Um, so categorization um, is preferred in some case. If data is very clean, then you don't need uh, this transformation. Any other questions? So you mentioned um, logistic regression and mm -hmm. neural networks. What else also works better with the categories? I'll show you. Okay. Yeah. So I have a. Um, um, List of recommended algorithms. Um, and okay, so here you go. <laughs> <laughs> These are most popular machine learning algorithms used by winners at um, data science competitions. Number one, gradient boosting machine algorithms. So um, originally developed at Stanford, but um, you don't need to know about uh, any details because we have a net point. So actually, uh, this is really great uh, tools uh, that builds a gradient boosting machine model uh, given um, uh, input data set. Um, it's currently the best uh, out of the box solution. If you don't know what to do, Use XGBoost, and you'll get a pretty good score. <laughs> <laughs> you 
can share the slides, right? They don't need to write it down. Right. Yeah, I'm going to uh, okay. share the slide. And um, how many of you um, heard about like a gradient boosting machine? Okay, yeah, this is great audience. I don't need to go. <laughs> <laughs> so random press, which was very popular um, back in early 2000, like 2000 and um, until 2010. Um, the best implementations uh, I found so far is um, for Python. I found it from Scikit-learn. For R, it's from random forest. Um, but uh, usually, it will give you um, uh, less accurate performance than um, gradient boosting machine. And it requires a lot of memories. Um, and extra tree is, is a similar, like a cousin of random forest algorithm. Uh, it's only available in Scikit-learn. It's not available in R. So why do you think gradient boosting works very well compared to random forest? Or are there any specific set of problems that it works better than the whole one? I mean, what is the main thing that is driving that performance information? So um, gradient boosting machine and random forest have different um, benefits, different advantages. So both are um, creating a lot of trees and um, Taking, um, combining predictions from um, multiple trees. Um, the difference is gradient boosting machine is training trees in serial. So you train first tree and generate prediction, get an error, and you train next tree of, of dedicated to reduce the error from first tree. And then you build third one to reduce the error from second tree. So it is designed to reduce um, bias. So uh, there, there is bias variance uh, trade-off. So it's designed to reduce bias error, which means uh, it's designed to improve accuracy, which is open times, most of times, the uh, target metric for data mining competitions. On the other hand, random forest is um, training multiple algorithms in parallel and taking the average uh, predictions across all the trees. So it's designed to reduce variance error, not the bias error, which means it's more uh, stable. It can generalize better. But uh, in terms of accuracy, uh, it's uh, worse than um, gradient boosting machine in practice. Than the variance by straight of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so although it introduced maybe some variance, it is not as much as bias that's introduced by random force. Yeah, uh, I don't want to go too deep okay. because, as I said, I don't have background in like hardcore machine learning. I'm a more practitioner, so um, I I don't like to stop there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, so top four algorithm, uh, algorithms are all tree-based algorithm. Um, it has a different like flavor of how to, how to combine predictions from multiple uh, multiple trees. And the next one is another very popular algorithm is neural networks. Um, you can um, call deep learning algorithm um, as a like relative of um, or variant of neural network algorithm. And it's available through uh, a Keras lasagna in Python and MXNet as an um, independent uh, implementation. So you just call the binary, then it will give you uh, predictions. It will generate the, build the model and generate the prediction for you. Uh, unfortunately, it, it's not available in R. The one of the benefits of neural networks is um, other than it's uh, really good predictive performance, it blends really well with um, a GBM algorithm. So if you have a GBM predictions, and if you have neural network predictions, when you combine those two, you will get, um, open times you get um, much better performance than any single um, prediction. So it's really good to have both algorithms in your toolbox. And uh, another, uh, method of using neural networks is 
uh, is the best uh, algorithm at image rec recognition competitions. So when there are images, uh, images are given as an input variable, and you need to predict whether this image is who this image is, uh, what, then um, neural network is the um, best performing algorithm um, for um, currently. And other um, next three algorithms are linear algorithms. So logistic regression, which is developed in developed in 200 years ago by Belgian math mathematicians, and um, which is very popular, very robust, it still works really well. So in practice, um, any companies in the industry claiming that they are doing machine learning or they are doing advanced attribution, um, I found that um, about 70% of chance they are running logistic regression model. <laughs> but um, I'm not blaming because it works really well um, in many cases. So um, the best implementation in Python um, can be found in scikit-learn package again. Uh, it based on lib linear implementation developed at National Taiwan University. And um, another powerful tool is uh, provided by Bopa Revy. Um, the, the the author of Boca Revy will be uh, in our post, will be in our next meetup, so everyone uh, should be hurry to sign up. It's fastest um, to train, fastest to uh, uh, build a model, and it also um, used uh, at the ensemble step. I'll uh, go um, more uh, deeper uh, about ensemble in. At the ensemble step, um, you usually prefer a more uh, simpler algorithm like logistic regression um, than a um, more sophisticated algorithm like gradient boosting machine or neural networks. And so forth, vector machine is another popular algorithm um, available through scikit-learn. And FTRL, specifically developed at Google for click-through rate prediction. And, um, not surprisingly, it works really well in a poor click-through rate estimation competition. So it, uh, uh, it will give you very competitive, not winning solution though, but very competitive solutions for click-through rate um, uh, competitions. The challenges in click-through rate uh, competitions are very high input space. So you need to deal with like millions of input features. So, so um, my understanding is that everybody's using these algorithms. So do you spend a lot more time on the feature engineering, or is it you know, spent on like feature engineering to use in conjunction with this? Because I think that you know, uh, in this day and age, everybody's you know using the defaults for XGBoost, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so even though you're getting pretty pretty accurate, it's you're not any closer to the finish line, right? Because everybody's there. Not everybody is there, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you're true. Um, so if you look at like top 25%, everybody is using um, XGBoost. And they are um, doing really hard to tune the uh, 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 model. So top, uh, top competitors use everything. So they have, usually uh, they have their toolbox ready to go so when they enter in a new competition, they do um, they spend a good amount of time in feature engineering, then turn on the switch for every single algorithm. Then they will all uh, generate predictions. And um, the next step is how to ensemble those predictions. There, uh, it can be distinguished from like winners versus. Uh, just top insert. Uh, my question is regarding ensembles. Is there a recipe what should what systems you should combine just from intuition or is there a heuristic that can be used in that case? Because it's often not possible to exhaustively try all combinations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me show you in a later slide. Um other very popular with them among competitors, but not uh, has not been adopted in industry yet is factorization machine algorithm. So in 2012, at KDD Cup, the author of a factorization machine algorithm um, 
participate in the competitions to um, like um, evangelize this algorithm and won um, two uh, two tracks uh, in 2012. There were two tracks uh, at Kevin Cuff and this author of uh, factorization machine algorithm won both track by using only a uh, factorization machine without using none of these. So this is very powerful algorithm. Um, probably uh, uh, you might not that familiar with uh, this algorithm, but it works really well. So if you haven't tried it, I highly recommend you to try it out. So the author of this algorithm uh, actually write the package, uh, which is very fast and very efficient. Um, so um, I, I want you to try it on. And uh, another, uh, one variant of factorization machine algorithm is field aware factorization machine, and um, which was which is developed at National Taiwan University. The same group uh, who developed the uh, lead linear and lead SVN, and this was the winning solution for a uh, click-through rate uh, critic estimation competitions. Uh, there were two uh, different click-through rate estimation competitions, but this I would won both um, um, the first prizes. There is a huge hype about big data and distributed computing. <coughs> Are any of these uh, running on a huge cluster? Are they distributed or? Yeah. Do they need distributed computing? It's a really good question. I'd love to answer. So, um, data input data are usually uh, somewhere between like one gig to a uh, couple of hundred gigs. But none of these um, competitions, I found one person, one winner who used uh, like distributed system so far. So. If you have really efficient feature engineering, if you have really efficient um, model, then up to like few hundred gigabyte input data, you don't need cluster. You don't need Hadoop or Spark um, until that point. If you have terabyte, petabyte, probably, but so far at any data mining competitions, no one uh, win, it, win the competitions by using um, um, how the words Yeah. Uh, just a, a little follow-up on that question. So then do you use your own laptop for uh, running these, uh, the computation? Or do you have a special server you made for this or something? Um, I have one desktop and one laptop. So this machine is used for like 80% of the time. And um, I spent $2,000 to build a like, um, desktop with a 6 core, 12 thread, 64 gig memory, and um, 3 gigabyte, uh, 4 gigabyte uh, hard with uh, HDD with 120 gig of SDD, uh, SSD. Um, so those are my machines. Keeping on that theme, do you, are you using any of the GP, GPU versions of any of those algorithms in the running? I want, I want it to, because I didn't want, I didn't win any um, image um, recognition competition so far, uh, because, um, so, yeah, that's my excuse. I didn't <laughs> use uh, GPU enough. But uh, these are all uh, GPU-based uh, implementation. So it can think this if you have a, like, Tigra uh, NVIDIA um, uh, graphic card. Any other questions? Okay. I might not be able to uh, cover the other half of the um, uh, talk, but yeah, I really want to share like uh, this best practice uh, with you guys. Okay, next thing is validation. Validation is very important because um, let's say you build a like um, key gas model against the training data set, so you are um, AUC score is 99% um, and your root mean square error is 10 to the minus um, 10. It doesn't mean anything until you can uh, reproduce search result against uh, test data 
for which you never observe the um, target label. So before you submit um, your predictions against the target label, you need to have a, a like systematic way to um, mimic uh, your past predictions in your uh, training uh, process. So the most popular one is uh, cross-validation. Um, more specifically, it's uh, called stratified cross-validation, which means you, tra uh, you split your training data into multiple fold, where the sample size as well as um, your target response rates are preserved. So let's say your click-through rate in your training set is uh, 1%, then you split the data into n fold while the uh, click-through rate for each fold uh, remains stays to be the same 1% across the fold. You can randomly, uh, usually you randomly split uh, this training data, and you train, uh, you, uh, train multiple times for each fold with a, a training set in that fold, generate the predictions um, for that fold. And at the end of the uh, training, you combine the predictions from each fold to get the uh, cross-validation predictions against this whole training data set. So instead of measuring your uh, performance against a uh, training data that you trained with, now you have a, a measure uh, for entire training set, but you never train your model with that data. So let's say your training AUC score is 99%, but your test uh, AUC is like 80%, then you get 80% instead of 99% of um, um, training error or the estimate of training error, um, which is more realistic. Um, numbers you get. So, do you have any questions about cross validations? So what happens if you have overfitting, let's say in fold two? Do you go on to the next step, or do you improve the model? You mean you you have uh, overfitted your model against a test? Yeah, set. any one of them. Yeah. So, um, it can happen, mm -hmm. but uh, it's not that likely because. When you train a model, you, you only observe uh, the labels from training set within that fold. You never uh, observe labels from this data set from this fold. And then when you train next fold, uh, next model for next fold, you uh, hold out uh, another test set and you don't observe your labels uh, against this hold up a uh, test set and then use other remaining data for training. So you never have an um, observation for, uh, from this uh, test set. So it's hard to overfit to uh, the uh, test set within the fold. And when you combine predictions from um, each fold, it's not likely you overfit against these um, test predictions. You can overfit to uh, training predictions. But it can happen. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, how do you cross-validate your feature engineering? Because, I mean, if you keep going up with features, you're eventually going to come up with some that have lower cross, I mean, better cross-validation scores. So how do you prevent the multiple hypothesis testing and incorporate that into that? Yeah, um, so for feature engineering, you do the same thing uh, as you do for model building. So you generate features for each fold without uh, using the uh, test data set uh, in each fold. Then um, after you generate features, you train the model with that features, not with other features, and you can actually uh, get the um, like estimate of um, how, how well it contributes to the modeling or not. Do you ever just look at 80% like, of the data when you are you reviewing it just to try to prevent? So some you look at 80% data. 
five times in this case, if you have five different holes against uh, five different 20% holdout data set. So you build, you work on 80% of your data, generate the features, and train the models, and um, validate against the 20% holdout set for each hole. So you repeat this process five times. So it's not likely you will overfit um, into um, your test, um, test set uh, in each hole. So the idea is the same. You don't allow yourself to use any information from your test data set. Um, whether you are building features or you are training models or uh, you are uh, ensembling predictions from other models. How do you know um, how many folds to do Y5? Is there too many or too few? Um, it's more of art than science. <laughs> <laughs> um, if data set is um, a very small, um, uh, you can go um, leave one out of validation, which means if you have uh, 10 uh, samples, you do 10 cross validation. So in each fold, you, have, you leave one sample out and train um, with uh, remaining nine. If you have enough data sets, uh, uh, you can do two for cross validation. You divide data half and half, so you train two models, one with first fold, or the other one with uh, next fold, and measuring uh, AUC score, um, the target metric score, and uh, take the average. So uh, if I'm dealing with a problem that has got I mean, the output is categorical variable. You have a class imbalance. How do they actually uh, deal with it? Um, so, as long as you have uh, enough number of samples of the imbalanced uh, target values, let's say uh, for click through rate uh, predictions, it's highly imbalanced uh, target. So, people only click less than 0.1%. But if you have huge volume, you can still do like um, tenfold or twentyfold cross validation, um, so that in each fold you will have um, the same number of clicks. Um, um, and usually, is it is it you, Seller, uh, yeah. who did uh, the test? Uh, probably not you, but uh, there was a test. So actually, try to sample. Um, uh, the narrative, narrative targets and uh, to see if it helps to make a more balanced target, it turned out uh, not healthy. So uh, most of the case, it's desirable to use imbalanced distribution of target variables as it is, rather than you downsample um, your narrative targets. Can you answer the question? Um, if I remember correctly, they tested both um, bias and variance in some promising results, but not the compelling in way. But uh, the other cases, performance just dropped. So it, it's counterintuitive because market supported the idea of like balancing sample dis target uh, distributions, but in practice, it doesn't work. And there are hundreds of cases um, like this. So market believed this, but um, uh, in reality, it doesn't work. Any other questions? Um, this is not about cross-validation, but um, I'd like to ask you the problem that I had in my recent challenge. <laughs> and the problem was the mismatch problem between training set and test set. So, for, I, for example, I'm working on speech signal. And we are, the training set is recorded in the, this kind of room. And the test set is recorded in the outside of the, you know, outside mm -hmm. of the building then you partially able to get such information from by listening to the test set, right? Because the test set is given in your case too. Then how do you handle this kind of mismatch issue? Have you uh, had this kind of experience? So first of all, um, what any machine learning algorithms are bad at predicting unobserved data. So uh, um, yeah, it's very challenging for any single algorithm. Um, and there are, for, uh, for the sake of Competitions, um, what you can do is you can do unsupervised learning against your test data set, um, which won't be possible in, um, in real life. And then uh, 
gather some information about. So uh, one particular approach is you train um, autoencoder against your um, past set data and then build um, neural networks or logistic regression on top of it. And, and that's another, um, that's another like long um, topic for long talk. So uh, just uh, yeah, autoencoder or um, similar tricks can be applied. Okay, are you good? Okay, mm -hmm. so personally, this is my best. Uh, this is my um, favorite. So, Angsangbo. Back in 2011 or 2012, you can, um, you could win a competition by using single algorithm, like factorization machine back in 2012, or support vector machine back in 2009, KDD cups. But it's not possible anymore. So you have to use multiple algorithms. Um, and how you combine predictions from multiple algorithms then? So um, we use, uh, there, uh, this is uh, something called ensemble framework or ensemble approaches. So um, here I'm sh showing you one kind of ensemble approach which is called stacked generalization or stacking. There are other kinds of uh, generalized, um, other kinds of ensemble approaches. So there is very good uh, tutorials on the web. Um, um, so you guys can uh, look it up um, after the talk. So um, for stacking generalization, it is clo closely uh, linked to cross validation framework. So basically, you split um, your, uh, you do cross validation um, with the, your single model training, and you get the uh, predictions against 100% training data set. <coughs> and you do, you train another model um, uh, by using predictions from single models as, as inputs. So let's say you have 10 different models, you train, you train 10 different models and get 10 different CV predictions, then you use that 10 predictions as, as 10 input features for ensemble um, step. And you can train on, on different algorithms. You can train neural network, gradient boosting machine, or logistic regression against a prediction from your single model. And then, by using cross validation framework, you can generate cross validation pred prediction from ensemble. Then you can train second stage ensemble model by using the prediction from first stage ensemble model as an as input. You can go on and on. So, in what you do with the test data set, you take 100% of trained data set in. Um, generate predictions, and you use predictions from um, single models as inputs to the, uh, your ensemble model, and you keep going on. So, ideally, uh, you can build like um, a ten, a stage ten ensemble approaches, but um, usually, uh, um, you you might want to stop uh, at the stage one or stage two or stage three in most. Would, would you ever transform the, um, the output of one stage before going to the next stage? The answer is yes, uh, but not as heavily as uh, feature engineering against the raw data. The most popular uh, transformations uh, at this step is uh, adding rank, ranking information. So when you have predictions from 10 different models, you can rank uh, the predictions so uh, between 1 to 10. Uh, so you have original 10 predictions, then you have 10 uh, ranking um, numbers as a feature. So that's one of the popular tricks. Um, another trick is you, um, you also add the maximum value of, of out of, of predictions and uh, add it as a um, new feature. 
So you can add maximum, mean, minimum, standard deviation, median. So you can add um, additional features to predict row predictions. Uh, what sort of improvement do you see from applying this ensemble? Is it like going from 90% accuracy to 90.5? It seems like a lot more work to train 10 models as opposed to just one. So I'm wondering what, for all that extra effort you're getting. Yeah. So in terms of putting extra effort, we usually put whatever it takes. <laughs> <laughs> the amount of effort is not a, a, not a concern as long as we can um, advance in the leaderboard. And, uh, <laughs> but um, that's a very valid question. The, um, I have a slide for that, but uh, if I give you a short answer, uh, I use the same framework uh, our team used the same framework at KDD Cup 2015 this year's KDD Cup, and the sing, uh, best single model predictions would uh, would have given us top six positions. And by using a first stage ensemble uh, model, it would be um, somewhere close to top three or four, but by using Stage three ensemble, we were able to be number one by large margin. By large margin, it's still 0 0.0014. But <laughs> <laughs> it's already as a, as a big margin. What's the advantage of submitting to the public leaderboard except to give information to your competitors? Uh, that's a very good question. So we do like to avoid um, overfitting at all cost. So we don't want to. Um, we don't want our model to overfit to either public <clears throat> leaderboard or training data set and perform really bad at a private uh, data set. So one major we can use it other than um, uh, cross validation error, another major we can use is um, the discrepancy between cross validation score and public leaderboard score. So I have very good slide for that. So. So these are all the submissions we made for KDD Cup 2015. And x-axis shows our cross validation um, score, and y-axis shows our public leaderboard score. And as you can see, it's highly correlated. But there is a uh, model submission that performs really well on cross validation, but performs um, um, not that great on public leaderboard. Then we we don't want to include this model into our um, blending because it will skew our model to a training set rather than uh, unseen data. So uh, this is another measure you can use uh, to avoid overfitting. Given that the leaderboard, the product leaderboard, and then is also very crowded. Uh, ran within a certain time to be able to uh, get scores. Um, other than that, mostly um, the running time is not an issue as long as you finish your model training within two months or <laughs> three months. <laughs> um, well, let's say model complexity. I mean, some kind of quality standard for deployability. Uh, so one restriction, uh, one requirement um, they uh, ask for uh, claiming the price is reproduce, uh, you need to reproduce the result. So if you cannot reproduce the result, then you cannot claim the price. Still, it's not, uh, uh, it's not addressing like complexity or running time issue. Um, as a practitioner, um, um, I agree with you about like what the kind of feeling that why why it matters? Why do you spend so much like computational power and um, energy to get like 0 0.00001 uh, improvement? Um, my answer to that question is that once you know how to achieve here in two months, that means you are likely to know to get here 
in an hour. So um, from the uh, at the beginning of uh, KDD 2000, uh, KDD Cup 2015 competition, I submitted, I, I built my first model on the business <coughs> trip to New York on the uh, flight. So without internet connection, with um, with only battery um, that goes only so far. So without any external information, I built my model, and I also listened to like just to one like audio books, and I <laughs> I caught up some like maps. Um, so I might have spent it, uh, spent only like an hour or two, but the score was good enough to get me in top ten. So in any of I would say any of master calculus, there, there are about 600 master calculus out of 400,000 now. And I can imagine that any single of them can build this good model, probably not if not within an hour, but within a day. So if you know how to get this, get here, then, then you might know how to get here very efficiently, very shortly. Any other questions? Okay. Um, let me see where we are at. Oh, actually, I covered everything for the first part of um, my presentation, and next part is actually the case study, uh, how uh, my team won the KD Cup this year. Um, so, uh, how are we doing in terms of time? We're kind of late, but <laughs> uh, I don't know if people want to stay to hear more, or you can shorten it, or you can wait to find an option. I know it would be hard for you to come. <laughs> then if it's a lunch hour, then yeah, I can <laughs> Okay, let me try to make it short. So this uh, presentation is originally presented by Kohei Mert here and Tom at KDD 2015 in Sydney this year as a winning solution for KDD Cup 2015. And our team name was Intercontinental Ensemble. You'll see why. So I'll skip uh, probably briefly. The uh, competition was to predict dropout rate in uh, massive online course. And student activity logs and metadata were provided. There were 821 teams and with the 200, uh, not 200, 20K um, dollars for the price. So data looked like this. 39 courses, 27,000 objects, 112K students, 200K enrollment data, 30 million uh, And our team consists of um, nine people around the world. So this is um, cool big and like about this data and um, data competition community. You can collaborate with um, any people anytime um, if you want. So, here in LA, myself and Mart are from Conversion Logic, and in New York, we have a Song Chen at AIG, and from Austria, we had um, Andreas and Michael, and from China, uh, Peking, we had Peng and Xia Kong, and from Singapore, we had Tang, and from Japan, we had Kohei. And so, since we work across time zone, we work 24-7. <laughs> <laughs> So collaboration, we use the Dropbox for file sharing and GitLab for um, code repository. And we maintain the internal wiki as well as internal leaderboard so that we can rank our predictions by cross-validation cross score as well as public leaderboard score. We communicate over Sky. So this was the moment uh, uh, we found out we were uh, number one. And we were number three 
uh, by 20 hours before the deadline. And top team was um, um, data batch from Japan and National Taiwan University. So data batch was 14 people team and National Taiwan University team was 20 people team had one had uh, one seven times at KDD Cup. Wow. So they are really uh, competitive um, competitors. In uh, 20 hours before the deadline, um, Kohei from Japan uh, continued to work on feature engineering um, and found that by using this magic feature, we call it magic. By including this magic feature, we get pretty good uh, leadable score uh, by using single machine. So we try to build first level ensemble model. And then second, uh, second stage ensemble, third stage ensemble, by submitting third stage ensemble model, we uh, rank the number one. So there was a Twitter stream from um, data batch team in Japan who used to be number one saying that they went to sleep and then <laughs> and found out yeah <laughs> so initially they thought it as a dream so they tried to sleep again <laughs> so I'll skip feature engineering part and um, this is, uh, these are uh, the uh, list of single models we trained. We trained 26 different gradient boosting machines, 14 different neural networks, 12 different factorization machines, 6 different logistic regression, 2 different um, common reach regression, 2 extra trees, 2 random press, 1 k nearest to okay. the well, Okay, quick question here. <laughs> yeah, but, you got to imagine that there's got to be like routing error between your guys' different computers at some point. It's like floating point precision. Um, like, is that is factor in at all? Like, when you guys, like, I got it, this number, and somebody else got another number? Like, we have this many amount of numbers, like, there's got to be some Actually, numbers. if consistent rounding errors, I will impress that. <laughs> if, if My question is, is it consistent across everybody's laptop on your team? Yeah, if it's inconsistent rounding errors, then we need to um, avoid that. But as long as it can be reproducible, it can be... Um, um, regenerate this up crazy then we'll still use it <laughs> so if you are uh, if you are uh, the person who can be content with um, top 10 percent or top 25 percent you don't want to go to this <laughs> <laughs> but if you are really competitive um, you really want to like break in like you really want to like um, grab the prize then this is what it takes so how are the say twenty six GBMs different? Um, so so GBM true. comes with um, a multiple uh, parameters you can tune: um, shrinkage array, number of trees, and um, a minimum child um, in the in each node, and also depth you can go down. So by using different combinations of those. Um, it can perform very differently, especially that uh, can give you very different results, even if you use the same implementation. Yeah, so random C, random C is can be possible. So resolving the parameters, were you trying maybe a different set of uh, features into each one of the models? Right. So other than uh, this uh, 64, so there are eight different algorithms, and we had a. Uh, Okay. <laughs> right, so I don't always build a model, but when I do, I build a hundred. <laughs> so the distribution of your mixture, uh, similar across different models, do you think, or no? Um, not really. So there are algorithms. Uh, so algorithms that perform better uh, changes across different competitions. That's the beauty of ensemble approach because. If you use the ensemble approach, and if you include all the algorithm in your single um, as your single model, then ensemble model will uh, assign um, correct weight across different algorithm uh, for each competition data set. But why did you stop at 26 GBMs? Why wasn't there a 27? 
But that's hard question. <laughs> <laughs> Let me skip that. <laughs> so this is our final framework. So we had uh, seven different feature sets um, developed independently uh, across members. And then we trained, again, 64 single models. Um, GVM, neural network factorization being most popular. And then using 64 predictions, as well as some um, additional features we added, like ranking or other statistics, we built 15 level 1 ensemble models. And then using predictions from 15 ensemble models, we built second level ensemble models, two second level ensemble models. And then lastly, we built a giant a final ensemble model by including all these models. So is it the number of models a function of the parameters of search that you're going through? You um, so it depends. So it can be one parameter set with the feature one, mm -hmm. same parameter set with feature two, and different parameter set with feature one, yeah, something like that. So we don't explore all the possible combinations, but um, yeah, again, it's more of art than science. So yeah. This was um, the, our solution to uh, KDK 2015. So what was the nature of the like breakthrough feature in NGT you know, change that you made to get you to number one? Uh, that's, um, that needs uh, some explanations and yeah. understanding in uh, data set. Yeah, if, you, um, if you're curious, then um, I can talk to you after the time. Okay. So, again, the improvement was 10 to the minus 3, but it was big enough uh, to bring us from 6th place to number 1. And um, we call it big margin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, here's the one slide I'd like to share with you. These are all the open competitions at Kaggle on now. So there are uh, Deloitte competitions and Ellen AI Science Challenge and other competitions with uh, three months, two months, um, 61 days left, uh, $100,000, $80,000 prize. Claim it. <laughs> Claim it. And um, in 2016, KDD conference will be in San Francisco, so our neighbor. So um, you can participate, prepare for KDD Cup 2016 and win it and go to San Francisco to present it. So I want you to <laughs> participate. And uh, this is the reason why I couldn't come earlier and I, I cannot make it like uh, evening um, meetups since last year. So these are all my um, employees <laughs> <laughs> on um, modeling and um, Christopher Bishop's machine learning. Tools. So yeah, without their support, I I wouldn't haven't been I have been able to um, achieve good um, performance at competition. Okay, thank you.